Hello and welcome to the build video series of this side table that I just completed. I may be mostly known for my jigs, but I actually build a lot of furniture as well. This will be done in my style of woodworking, mixing machines and jigs and hand tools. And I've chosen quite traditional joints for this table, but I have some innovative ways to make them sometimes. And the table itself also has some innovative features. Looking at the inside of the front apron, I have this routed in solid metal bars and that is to be able to control this very long and thin sections above and below the drawer. I will show you how I achieved this look where the drawer front is cut out from the front apron and grain matched almost to perfection. On the drawer I will show you my technique for freehand routing these half blind dovetails and I will also show you the concept with mounting the drawer bottom from underneath. This maximizes the drawer depth in a given drawer height. The drawer stop is quite simple but it's fully recessed in the back apron and doesn't consume any height or depth of the drawer itself. This is divided into two parts. Part number one will start with lumber selection. This is always important for product but even more important when you want to make a front like this with a grain match drawer into the apron. Then I will continue part number one with a mortise and tenon joinery for the legs, tapering of the table legs and in part number one I will also show you how I created this seamless grain match look on the front and the routed in metal bars on the back side. Part two will cover the remaining items, the drawer build itself and the stretchers and runners for the drawer. In part two I will also show you how I did to center the drawer in the opening. Then I will make a top for the table and some small items like the drawer pull and the drawer stop, some other things and then I will put the finish on it. It's time to start the build and I will start with lumber selection and layout of the different parts that I need. To me these two are strongly connected and they will both have big impact on the looks of your final build but they will also to some extent affect the properties of the parts. I think this topic is a bit neglected in many build videos and plans. And taking myself as an example, I knew at least 10 ways to make perfect dovetails long before I felt confident choosing my own planks at the lumber yard. Going to the lumber yard, I usually bring a paper like this with a sketch of my project as well as the minimum board sizes that I need. If I only had the board sizes and no sketch, I would have problem to visualize what each part is for. But having the sketch as well, this is easily visualized and I can customize the look of each part. If we start with a big picture, all my planks are quite close to each other in color tone and they also all have a quite tight grain pattern. And for a small product like this, I prefer to have tight grain patterns. If this was a big farmhouse table, I maybe would have preferred to have more big and lively grain patterns, but on a small product like this, a big and lively grain pattern will look a bit messy in my opinion, so here I prefer these tight grain patterns. Before going into details on each board and the layout, I cut away these pieces from each side of each board, and that's due to two reasons. The main reason is that you often have end grain cracks and they can propagate quite far into board, these cracks need to be cut off before doing the layout. And the other reason is that it's easier for me to show you the end grain on a freshly cut surface than on the painted surfaces. Taking a closer look at each board, starting with this one here. This is for the legs and the thickness of this is around 55 millimeters. The thickest portion of the final legs will be 45 millimeters. I always aim to have at least 5 millimeter margin on the thickness for jointing and planing. For furniture legs I always try to find lumber with diagonal growth rings on the end grain side as that will give a uniform look on all four sides of a leg. So if we first take this one here for example with diagonal growth rings it looks pretty much the same from all four sides. Comparing that with a board that has vertical or horizontal growth rings looking from this side it looks like this and looking from the other side it looks like a completely different part. Layout wise this part was quite simple, two pair of legs, I have no snipe on my planer and I am quite tight on the length dimension at this moment, about 3 to 5 cm margin. The next two boards are these ones here, they are for the top and some internal parts. 
I would have wished to make the top out of one big board, but I didn't have that big boards on my lumber yard at the moment. So instead I chose two boards that were very similar in color and grain pattern. The thickness of these is around 34 millimeters and they will be glued up as a panel and the final thickness of the top is 25 millimeters. Here I also have some portions of diagonal growth rings on the end grain side. This makes sure that the size of the table will be quite similar as the top surface when it comes to looks. I chose the best parts of these boards to become the top, four pieces in total for that panel glue up and then the remaining length will be non-visible internal parts. The final board is this one here and this is for the aprons. The thickness of this is around 32 millimeters and the final thickness of the aprons will be 25 millimeters. Here I'm close to vertical growth rings on this surface here. And that minimizes the movement in this direction and that is very good. I want to build in this drawer with really tight gaps. It also makes the Side surfaces look really wild and crazy compared to everything else in this build, but no one will ever see the sides of the apron. On this board I was looking for really straight grain, at least in the portion where I have this built-in drawer. To make this happen later I need to cut here and here, and then I push things together again. So if I had wavy grain here that would mean a mismatch, but now I have straight grains and the matching here and here should be really good. Layout wise I chose the best pieces of this board to become the left, the front and the right apron. And starting with the left apron I will have match here and here. So all the visible aprons will be matched around the legs. And then the remaining part of this board becomes the back apron. Layout complete and I'm quite satisfied with the utilization of these boards. They leave very little room for error though, but I do have the remaining length of the leg board if or when I do mess up and need some extra wood. That was a few words about lumber selection and layout. There is much more to say about this subject. I also have to say that this is of course individual. This suits my building style in this project and the look I'm after. If I was another woodworker or had another project, the lumber selection would most likely look different. I start by rough cutting my boards to length and as you can see the dust collection system for this mitre saw is very well engineered. This is pretty much the only task I use the mitre saw for, so I haven't bothered that much about it. These boards are done at this stage, I don't need to rip them to get to rough dimensions. These ones I need to rip and sometimes before doing that I quickly joint one edge to have as reference on the bandsaw, sometimes I don't, it's a bit depending on how warped the parts are and how wavy the edges are. I do a quick check on the edges and they all look quite straight, so I think I skip the jointing and go directly to the bandsaw in this case. The entire puzzle is laid out and I think it looks beautiful. The things we've done up until this point may have seemed like a transport, but they will heavily affect the final appearance of the build. I will now join and plane these boards, but not to final dimensions. On some of these boards I have quite much material to remove, and if you take everything in one go, there is a risk of warpage. So I will still keep them oversized about 2 to 3 millimeters. Then when it's time to use the board in the build, I will do the final jointing and planing of that board. Jointing planing is over for today and it's time for the Friday night pizza and beer. These ash pieces were really bright and nice under the surface, just like I had hoped for. Tomorrow I will start with planing or jointing planing, depending on if they warped or not. The leg parts to final dimensions and then I will do the joinery for the legs. The remaining boards are placed over here and these will be handled later. Here I placed wooden pieces between each layer and that is to keep air circulation between the boards. If you place a newly planed board on a flat surface without air circulation, it's high risk that it warps.
Pizza is finished. New day, new possibilities. It's time to check the leg parts for war pitch and then plane them to final dimensions and then cut the mortises into the legs and taper them. You could use a straight edge for this, but I think it's easier to just push the parts together and see if I have gaps anywhere that would indicate warpage. Then I just randomly rotate a few pieces and do the same test. This still looks very straight and true. I also make a final check with a square to make sure that my parts are square, and they are. So I decide not to rejoint this one, I put them through the planer to get them to final dimensions. Now cut my leg parts to length and to eliminate any tear out on the exit side of the cut I put the sacrificial board on my crosscut sled. Before laying out the mortises I have to decide what's front and back and left and right and up and down on these leg pieces. And here I also bring out the front apron and the legs that best matches the front apron in grain and color will be the front legs. When I'm satisfied with the position and orientation of my leg pieces I go ahead and mark this on the end grain surfaces front left, front right, back left, back right. It's time to lay out the mortises for this haunched tenon. I use this haunched tenon with a cut up here that allows me to have a long tenon without weakening the leg too much. The aprons are slightly offset outwards and the tenons on the aprons are also offset outwards and that is to give me some extra tenon length without colliding inside the mortises. I then bring out my mortise jig. I have an entire video about this jig. I will link that in the description and today I will just quickly show you how it works. While pushing my workpiece upwards towards the top surface I clamp it in place here on the underside of the jig with these integrated clamps. I place a stop block in this position, then I don't have to worry about the lengthwise positioning for my remaining work pieces. If we then look on the other side, down here is my work piece. This is the deep mortise I want to make and this is the hunch part. If we then zoom out a little, I have a stop both in the front and back position. Here I use my router with side fences on both sides, guiding against the jigs outer surfaces. I begin by setting the left to right position and here I aim for my layout lines then I lock the router on the guide bars and then again aiming for the layout lines I set my back position stop and I do the same for the front position stop on the front stop I have this special feature it sits with magnets so the plan here is that I first route my full depth mortise and then I remove this stop here and run the hunch part at the lower depth and I do this on the fly After routing the mortises you can choose to square the corners in the mortises or round off the coming tenons. I prefer to square the corners in the mortises. That was all the mortises. The next step is to make a taper on the inside of the legs. I will cut these tapers with my tapering jig and then I will finish off with a few strokes with a hand plane. The jig works like this, it travels in one of the mitre slots. It has an adjustable side fence that also can be tilted both directions and locked in position. In the back it has a stop as a reference for my workpiece. This edge here is cut using this position of the jig. So this edge is exactly where my saw blade will cut and I use that as a reference. Then it has these routed in tracks for clamps that are used to clamp the workpiece. I start by setting the angle and position of my side fence. And if we look in the front first, I put it so that my line is just inside the edge. Then I have a little margin for hand planing the tapers later on. And in the back I do it pretty much the same way. I set the fence so my line is just inside the edge of the jig.
Then I slide in the clamps in the tracks, take my workpiece and push it against the stock in the back and against the fence, and here I clamp it in position. I will start by cutting edge number one and then rotate my workpiece clockwise and cut edge number two. This way I will have a flat stable reference against the jig for both my cuts. For the final touch up of the tapers with hand plane, I make a few lines here as I approach my layout line. This way I will know when I'm close to my layout line and stop planing. I stop planing when my final helpline is planed away. This is where I stopped. You can see the color difference. I leave the rest for the final sanding. Tapers done, which means the legs are complete except for final sanding, but that will be done later. I will now make the aprons and it's time to bring out the super jig to cut some tenons. But before that I will focus on the front apron and the cutout for the drawer front, as this will need some special attention. Here I will use these solid metal bars that are recessed into the front apron. That is to be able to control these thin and very long sections above and below the drawer. I begin this by jointing and planing my front apron piece to final thickness. And the width I still leave it a bit oversized. I then lay out the position for my metal bars. And I use a handheld router with a fence on left and right side and stops in the front and back to route my recesses. That routing needed to be done while I still had plenty of materials on both sides of my groove. If I tried to route the groove like this, this close to an edge, it wouldn't work very well. With the metal bar screwed in place, I can now go ahead and plane my board to really thin thickness outside the metal bars. I then rip my front apron into three pieces. After the first rip, I send it through the planer to keep one reference side. This leaves me with three surfaces that needs to be planed afterwards. I lay out the drawer front and cut away this part from the middle piece. Before gluing the parts together I remove any planer and saw marks on the surfaces that will be impossible to sand after glue up. Then it's time to glue the parts together without the drawer front. I then use a hand plane for the final cleanup and to get this really smooth and invisible seamless transition between the parts. Then it's time for a test fit, mainly to see how well the grey matching worked out. So I push the drawer front into this hole in the front. Ooh. So far I'm really satisfied with the result. The glue lines are invisible and the grey matching between the drawer front and the frame is really good on this side. If we check the other side as well, it's even better and it's almost impossible to see that this is made out of three pieces of wood. And this concept with a recessed metal bar seems to work out very well. Both these sections are very straight and that means the drawer gap is really consistent all over the length. Also if I press on the middle it's super stiff and I believe that these metal bars will keep these sections straight over time. And there we leave the opening in the front apron and the drawer front itself. For now I will continue with the drawer at the later stage in this project. If you thought that this was a bit too fast, I would most likely make a separate video edit of how I made this hole. And there I will take it a bit more slow and add a bit more comments and reflections. With the front apron complete, at least when it comes to width and thickness, these other apron pieces will have to follow. They are still oversized. 
And the first thing is to determine which part of these oversized apron pieces that I want to use. The back apron I don't really care about that will not be seen and not match with anything else. But for the side aprons I can do my best to match the grain with the front apron. There will be legs in the way later on, but at least I can do a decent matching. I start this by laying out the effective length of my front apron. And there I make a mark on both sides, then I know which part of this apron piece that I will use. Then I take my side apron pieces, both left and right side, I slide that up until the line. And then I can move it up and down and see where I have decent grain matching. This will not be perfect in any way, but at least I will use the same part of the plank as I did for the front apron. And here I make lines on the apron piece, so I know which part of it to use. After rough cutting my apron pieces to size, I rejoint them, and then I plane them to final thickness and width. I start by cutting my apron pieces to length and after that make the layout for the tenons. I have laid out one complete tenon, in this direction it's slightly off centered but that doesn't matter, I will only use one side as a reference when I cut my tenons. And from this side you can see the horns part and then I will make a small shoulder down here. The tenon looks a bit short, it's about 22 millimeters. And I will have plenty of glue area so that will be strong enough for this small table. For the remaining aprons the only layout I have are these yellow tape pieces and they are facing outwards and upwards on every part. And then I also freehand sketched the Hans tannon corners so I know which corners that is. I will cut the tannons on the super jig, the world's best table saw joinery jig. This is not only limited to cutting tannons, I use this for all kinds of joints, both straight and angled ones. This jig has its own set of videos and there are plans available, but today is not about this jig, so I tried to give you one minute crash course how this jig works for cutting a tenon. This angle part here I refer to as the carriage and that is where I clamp my work pieces. And for tenons like we're cutting today, I use my reference side against the jig's reference surface and then I clamp it in place with a support piece behind to avoid tear out on the exit side. The carriage slides on two linear rails and it moves left to right using the control wheel on my left hand side. The motion is transferred using a ball screw, that's a CNC component without any sideway free play. And that together with a linear rail motion are two of the keys to the precision in this jig. The control wheel is divided in 80 segments and I have 0.05 movement of the carriage between each segment. The cutting is controlled using these colored pins and when they are in line with this black line on the jig, I should make my cuts. Down here I have my storyboard or template and for a single tenon like this it will look something like what I have here. I make my first cut at the green pin and then at the red pin a couple of turns later I make my second cut. The template is only there to give me a rough overview of what I'm doing. I'm using the pins and the reference line to make the actual cuts. To set up the jig for a tenon cut, I start by setting the blade height to just below my layout line. I want to stay below it since I cut the shoulders later on the crosscut sled. I then move the carriage until my blade is in line with my left hand layout line. Here I put the green pin in the hole that is closest to match the black reference line on the jig. And I use this scale ring to zero the system. In this first cut position I make a green line on my storyboard. I then go ahead and measure my mortises and they are all around 10.05 millimeters, so I will aim for 10.0 on the tenons. To reach the second cut position, the carriage should move the tenon thickness plus the thickness of the saw blade. I use the control wheel to set the second cut position. The carriage should move tenon thickness, that's 10 millimeter, plus the saw blade thickness 3.25, that's 13.25 in total. There are 4 mm for each turn of this wheel, so I start counting. It's 4 mm, 8, 12, and then another 1.25 to reach 13.25. And I use the numbers on this scale ring to set the second cut position. And here I make a red line on my storyboard indicating the second cut. 
that may have been a bit quick, but as I said, there are instruction videos available for this jig and there I take it more slow. With some experience, you set up a cut like this in under a minute and I don't make any test cuts anymore since the accuracy in this system is so good. I also cut the haunch part as well as the lower cheek, here I don't move the control wheel and I hold the work pieces by hand. After those cuts on the super jig my tenons looks like this. I will go ahead and cut the shoulders on the crosscut sled and then let's see if they fit as good as I expect them to. Here I stay slightly below my tenons, that will give me a small rest after cutting the shoulders but that is easily cleaned away with the chisel. Here I use a stop block with a small step in it and that is for the off cut to be free to move. After those cuts I use the chisel to clean away the small rest in the inner corner. You who have seen the super geek videos will not be surprised, but if we have some new viewers aiming for 10.0 millimeters without any test cuts at all. And that's the kind of accuracy that you can expect with this jig. When using this Hans Mortis and Tannon on a piece that not will be visible in the end result, like in this case, this surface will be covered by the top later on. Then I usually have a small gap here between the harsh part and the mortise. And that is to not risk bottom out here before the joint is fully seated on the visible surfaces. With the mortise and tenon joints completed, I think it's time to give you a break and I end part 1 here. In part 2 I will make the sliding dovetail joints for the stretchers and the draw build and the remaining items. I place a link to part 2 somewhere here and I hope to see you there. Thanks for watching.